lady. Who happens to be here today? Over there. So on your way out, say, man, you did such a good job raising that Gavin. He is such a great guy. You ever get a chance? She's over there. I talked to my, uh, my stepdad, Dan, who was singing bass with us today. What would you rather have me have done? Asked you to sing bass or preach? He said, preach. So next time I know, I don't have to plan the lesson when they come to visit. I think 40 plus years of preaching trumps uh, one hour of practice for singing with us. They did a great job, and I appreciate him coming and stepping in for Chris while he's traveling and enjoying retirement. One of the things that we do here before we get into our lessons is uh, we have to set the mood. That sounds weird. Um, but we've learned, and I will say this, so those who are visiting, we've learned that uh, sometimes it's important for us to have a sense of humor because when we're able to laugh at things, um, we cannot take ourselves so serious, but we also can handle serious situations and topics because it helps us to be ready to hear some things. Uh, and so, I heard the story of a guy uh, who was getting a wedding set up for his daughter, and he called the, the bakery, and he was getting the cake set up, and he told them, I need you to do me a favor, and I need you to get on the top of the cake, written out the, the scripture, 1 John 4.18. I just need it around it because I love what it says, and I think it would be great for my daughter and her future husband to have this message. Well, the baker kind of uh, forgot to put the one in front of the John, and it was just John 4.18, so what he wanted it to say was, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. But instead, it read, on the other hand, this is what it says, it says, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you have is not your husband. You can see how that might be. Typos. Gotta work on the delivery part. Um, today we're gonna to be learning about, in order for us to truly know what it means to push forward, we have to learn how to follow. Our world wants us to think that life is about us. So much so that we bring that into uh, everything. So I don't know how many of you are on social media. How many of you, even if you don't use it, I'm just curious, how many of you use Facebook? Hey, do you know what Facebook does to your account every day? They observe what you do. You know that? They, they, they observe how you comment. They, they observe what articles you click on. And do you know what they do? They feed you stuff that you like. <clears throat> they want you to feel like everybody thinks the way that you think. It's kind of screwed up our world a little bit. But for them, they make a lot of good money on that because they advertise to people who they know you personally like. Do you know that we do this even when we come to worship? We hope that whatever this person says up here or whatever we read in the Bible fits what we like. And if we don't have someone who fits what we like, what do we do? Well, before we leave, <laughs> we stir things up and complain. And then we say, man, that other place I went to, which we already know is false because you're here. So if you say that other place I went to really, you know, did it this way, and I liked it. Which leads us back to the first thing we talked about, right? Pushing beyond our past, pushing beyond our traditions, because sometimes we look backwards and we say the good old days are so great, and you forget, no, we were poor. I struggled to, to make it. My parents had to work so hard for us to have not much. Some of us, some of you, you might have said, yeah, life was good because you fell on some hard times, but you still look backwards, and it looks so much prettier looking back because Looking forward, there's some fear there because there's some unknown. And God's calling you something better. But what we're going to talk about today is pushing forward. We need to know what it means to follow. Who we're following and how we're supposed to do that. And so, I wanted to start us with this. Um, I'm going to pull up a chair to talk to you. That never catch me. Randy's going to attest, we cooked 650 hot dogs on Friday for a school, and I'm a little burnt. So I'm just going to try to cool myself under this pan and do this, so I apologize for saying. Um, 
one of the things that we need to look at when we are talking about following Jesus is it's not about the you. And so we're going to look at a, a verse, but I want us to think of, when we think of being a follower or a disciple of Jesus, it should mean less of me and more of Jesus. Everything that we do in following Jesus should be shaping us to look and act and be like him, because that's, that's the point. Being a Christian is being Christ-like. We can't do that unless we follow in his footsteps. But like I said before, sometimes we think that Jesus isn't just the Son of God, that he came, took our sentence for us, and, and that we now live in his grace and want to serve him. Sometimes we think of Jesus as this mystical genie, Jesus, and he grants all my wishes. We don't call them wishes, we call them prayers. And we usually formulate our prayers to help our lives to become better for us. And we justify it by saying, no, it's for us to have great lives so that we can be this whatever for Jesus. But when I read scripture, and when I see what it looks like to follow Jesus, I see a lot of hard times. And there's some suffering involved. Now we are blessed, and we have this great promise, and, and we live in a forgiven life, and we have something that's so great because we have a promise of eternity. But while we're here, we are called to do this, to follow him. This is what he tells us. In Luke 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. We're called to ignore a lot of the things that we enjoyed before we found ourselves committed to Christ. I want you to think about that. If you need to, if you're visual and you need to close your eyes and think of these things, close your eyes and think about the life that you had before you committed yourself to Jesus. Even you who were raised in the church, we still had lives that were, they were different. We weren't committed. Now, even after we committed ourselves to Christ, the journey didn't end. We continued. So you can even look back and say, I remember getting up out of that water and I felt so good. And then like two weeks later, I was right back to some of my old stuff because we don't just automatically know how to be different. We have to learn it. We have to mature. We have to follow some things. We have to get there. Many of us, like myself, if we go to somewhere like Ikea and get furniture, you don't like to look at the instructions. Like myself. I don't. I figure, I got this. I'm a man. I got, a, I got an Allen wrench, and I got some screws, and there's holes that go in there. It's going to be perfect. Only to find out after you built it, there's some leftover parts, and it doesn't all match up, and you might have done something wrong, and you go, oh, no, I have to take it all apart. And what do we do? We go back to the instructions, and then your wife says, oh, you should have the instructions. what happens. Um, and I will still do that. So I haven't learned completely how to be a better follower of directions, but... The more and more we learn from our mistakes, the more we go back to what the truth is, that master plan that leads us to where we're supposed to go, the better we are at looking like what he has called us to be. Now, I have, I want to share, we read this verse earlier. I think we can get this right. Disciple kind of means follower. It doesn't mean like sideline, spectator. It doesn't mean fan. It doesn't mean like, Jesus, I love you, but you live your own life. Like follower means I'm walking in step with him. Jesus was a follower of his father. And it says that he was humble, that he was everything that he had, all the power that God has, he's part of God, right? But he came to this earth and humbled himself, humbled himself even to death on the cross. When he could have came out and just did like this thing of like, I don't want to die today. You all get to die instead. And he could have did that. He could have had somebody else take the cross. He could have did all these things. But you know what he did? He humbled himself even to death on a cross. And what does he ask us to do? He asks us to take up our cross daily, <clears throat> to humble ourselves by denying all of the selfish and fleshly desires that we want, to humble ourselves, pick them up, and follow in his footsteps, even to death. I want to see us kind of live that parallel. But he gives us this next thing. When we read it for our scripture reading, I want us not just to follow God, I'm the worst person for someone to ask, like, I'll just follow you to get there because I don't drive slow and I forget there's someone following me and I'll go through yellow lights and I, I get really fast. And if you're not up against me, you are going to get lost. And even if you follow me, I'm not good with directions. You're probably going to get lost anyways. But let's just say, if we go somewhere, if you aren't near me, 
you are not going to get where we're going to go because I just forget that someone's following me. Okay? When we follow Jesus, if we aren't following close enough, we're going to miss him. But here's an important thing. I want to share this story. I went to school with a guy his name is Brian. At the age of 12, Brian lost his eyesight. So for 12 years, he, he, had, he knew what things looked like. He had all his vision. Uh, after 12, the only thing he could see is kind of shadows. But for the most part, he was completely blind. Brian did something, though. He didn't allow a disability to limit his life. And this is a, a guy with covered eye with. And one day I saw him walking around campus. He didn't have really anybody guiding him. Sometimes he would walk and he would use this thing that would click and he could figure out how he, how he heard it. And I thought that was awesome. He still knew how to play the guitar. He knew how to do all these things. And I was super impressed. He would even tell us, like, I know exactly how far away the staircase is from where I'm at right now. And I was like, that's impressive. How do you know that? And he would just kind of let us know, I need to know where I'm at all the time. And if I don't, then I will get hurt or I'll, you know. So once he gets to a place, he figures it out. That is impressive enough where you should go, that is so awesome. Brian was a top-ranked downhill mountain biker. Now you go like, how did he do that? He should have, he, that should kill him because he can't see anything. This is how Brian would get down the mountain. A guy would be in front of him and there would be a sound on the back of his bike and it would click, 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 click like this. And he would follow the sound. And if he wasn't close enough to hear the sound, then he would get in an accident. But he would follow that sound and it would get him down the mountain. It was just the craziest thing. He told me a story about one time where he thought he heard the person in front of him. But the person in front of him uh, had gotten a little bit further ahead and he started following a different sound. He got this pretty bad wreck. And he, he made the statement of, I guess I needed to be a little closer to make sure that I was hearing the way I needed to go. This guy backpacked through Europe with us. He did a lot of great things. But this one kind of stood out for me. In order for him to reach a goal and be competitive in the life that he wanted to live, which was, I don't want my disability to limit me. I want to do all these great things. Even with how good he was, he would never make it down the hill unless he had that person that he could follow to get there. And he had to stay close enough so he could hear him. We read this verse for our scripture reading this morning, and this verse says this, it says, my sheep listen to my voice. And I, I want us to, to read this part together. It says, starting at I, ready? I know them, and they follow me. You see, I... My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then he goes on and says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What do we know about sheep? They're dumb. So we get them, they're not bright. What do we know that sheep need to do in order to be safe? They have to have somebody who guides them to places, because this is what they'll do. If they stay in one area, they will eat all the grass, but they'll just stay there until they die. There's nothing left for them to eat unless they're guided somewhere else. Sometimes one will get lost because it, it got too far away from the shepherd and didn't hear his voice. But the great thing about this is not only does he say they, they hear my voice, they listen to it, but when they are listening to his voice and they are near, this shepherd says, and I know them, and they follow me. Yeah. It's really easy for us to follow these other voices in our life and we start to think that they're the right ones. And we're not the only ones that do this. We can look at, throughout time, people who follow God. The Israelites had a real struggle in this. If we even just take the example of them leaving Egypt, they had God leading them by day and night. In the daytime, it was this pillar of smoke, and nighttime, it was a pillar of fire. That in itself is crazy to me that you would see that. On this journey, they saw the sea split. And they walk through it. And you're like, this is incredible. Before any of that happened, they saw all these plagues that got them out of Egypt. They saw some stuff. And it was awesome. However, every time any adversity hit them, they started listening to different voices in them and themselves. Satan is really good at this. He got them to question them. And I can imagine the question being, does your God really love you? You're hungry now. Does he really love you? The Egyptians are getting closer. You're going to die out here. And what do they do? They complain. Because they started listening to voices that were not the voice of God that was leading them. 
they lost sight of listening to their leader, which was Moses. When Moses went away for a little bit, what did they end up doing? They thought God needed a helper. So he took all the gold that Moses brought. Must have been a good craftsman, melted it down, made his golden calf. Thought God needed another God for help. We can lose sight of where we are supposed to stay in step with God when we start listening to the other voices of this world. Satan is so good at it. He's been good at it since, since he fell from heaven. Eve. Look at that fruit. Did God really say you're going to die? He just doesn't want you to have what he has. Taste it. See? They're still here. Did he ever give them anything like an order, any of that stuff? He did. He got them to question the voice that they had trusted for so long. They walked hand in hand with God. They, they walked around the garden and they were given instruction and they, they were this innocent creation that God made perfect the way he wanted to and they were with him and it was great and it just took some questions, a different voice that led them in a different direction. They weren't close enough to trust the voice that was leading them down the hill. Instead, they thought they were listening but they were getting distracted. And here we are, still dealing with the same struggles. The voice inside of you might be saying, you know, you could use your time that you're giving to God to make more money, and then if you have more money, you'd be happier. You know, I know you're married, and it, you used to be into it. Now you're not, but you know, you could serve God so much better if you just gave up on that and found something different. You know that church you're going to, they served smelly coffee. You went, you went somewhere else. They might give you the real good stuff. Wake you up. So go find something else. Always look for something different. Don't have this consistent voice that's telling you, just trust me, follow me. I placed you where I need you to be. I gave you the skills. I gave you the gifts. I want you to be where you are. And I have a plan for you. But the biggest part of that plan is to pick up that cross Stand in my footsteps, and you will make it where I have you to go. It's not going to be easy, because picking up a cross does not sound easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus. He needed help from a guy named Simon to carry the rest of the way up the hill. Carrying the burdens of yourself, it's not, that's not your job. That's not what picking up a cross means. Picking up a cross is to say, I choose Jesus. I choose his sacrifice in my life. I choose to humble myself, my wants for his wants for me. And I will do that until the day that I get to go home to him. Wouldn't that be such a great promise to get there? And he says, well done. You finished. I worried about you for a little bit. But you heard my voice, and I knew you. I knew you would make it. And I want to give you eternal life. I put this in your heart that you will not get snatched out of my hand because you have me dwelling within you. The Holy Spirit gives us a better megaphone of that voice that we should follow. If we commit our lives to him, that gift of that spirit dwells and lives within us. And it should be the voice that guides us to that promise that God has for us through his son. He gives us that same gift that raises Jesus from the dead to dwell within us. That's powerful. You know, I was thinking about something as I was prepping for this. And usually, the things that you do the most, it starts to become your identity. Anybody here, uh, you know, you, I don't know how to say it this way. If you used to smoke or have friends that smoke, what do you do on your break time? You become the smoking crew. And in circles, you look against the world. At least 20 feet from the building. Even in the winter while it's raining. You are committed. That's your identity. How many of you every morning go through that nice Starbucks drive through Because your identity is when you get to work, everybody knows that you have that Starbucks cup in your hand. Because you are the Starbucks person. Younger crowd, desperate, I get it. You think it's cooler, way sugarier, but I get it, you know, that's you. When I was growing up, I had a lot of friends that their identity became where we were, in our neighborhood or, or what they were affiliated with, 
and bad or good, that's just what their identity was because they didn't have it in something bigger than themselves. So they found it and whatever would accept them in. So for some of my friends that was getting into gank, for some of it was doing other things that probably weren't the best for their lives. And however, for some other ones, it became my identity needs to be something that's bigger that's getting me out of this situation. So if it's like, I'm gonna be the one that goes to college. And that identity for that one of my friends and his whole family was, he's the one. Don't let him get into all this other stuff because he's the smart one. He's the one that's gonna get out of this. And he did. But his identity was all based on the things that you want the most for your life. If you want success, your identity is gonna be that guy who works so hard and he's just, and I'm saying success in life, financially paid. That guy always works so hard, he can't wait to climb the next ladder, the next ladder. We want him working for us, hard worker. He wants to make that money, whatever it is. With Jesus, it's, it's, it should be different. When people know that we are saved people, they should know that we are saved people. The way in which you act, the way in which you behave, you should know by how you treat people, who you serve, and where your identity lies. In Galatians, we're told this, like what happens. And, and I want us to, to look at this. And it says, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have done what? Clothed Clothe yourself with Christ. What does that mean? What should that mean? What do you do when you get clothed in the morning? Covered. There we go. You're putting him on. Shouldn't that be apparent with how we are living? That when we were baptized into Christ, that we clothed ourselves with him, that we have been made new, that all those things that defined us before go away. Because he tells us this. This were all the defining things of the time. No longer, this is what they thought of us. No longer are you now Jew or Gentile. That was a big division for them. Even when they believed in Jesus, this was still a big division for them. But you're not that anymore. This is even bigger. No longer are you slave or free. Imagine being a slave owner of that time, different than our time of slave owner, but let's just go with both of them. You no longer see that person as your property anymore. You see them now as Jesus. The next biggest divide, which is still one of our bigger divides, right? You're no longer male or female. What are we? We are one in Christ Jesus. The moment we have committed our lives, even though we're still figuring it out and we're not perfect and we're just getting there, and, but that moment we have decided to follow Jesus, that we have been clothed in his righteousness, that we have taken him on in baptism, we are now one in Christ. It's no longer young or old or, or black or white or rich or poor or male or female. It is you are Jesus to me, and I want to treat you that way. You know, it goes even deeper than this for us because when we made that commitment, we're actually called to see everyone that way. It's easy for us to want to serve and to, to sacrifice ourselves for those who are like us or that think like us, but we're called to even do that for those who hate us. Because that's what Jesus did for all of us. Could you imagine being Christ coming to this earth knowing that what your sacrifice is going to do is going to save many, but there are many who are never going to accept you. There are going to be many who are never going to validate the fact that you were our Savior. But he did it for them anyways. And yet we can't even stand being in the same room with some people. We avoid certain areas altogether so we don't have to go there. Kind of like Costco parking lot. Just ask <laughs> get there at the right time. We avoid things because we don't want to be around what is different or discouraging or whatever, but instead we can be a light to the world. We can bring seasoning to a stale place. We can be the salt and the light to a dark place. But it takes us knowing who and why and how we should be following Jesus. <laughs> I remember every time we go to the snow and we like to go on sledding hills or we do whatever, and 
before you really start getting everything packed down. It's really soft, you can sink really far. And uh, this happened when I was a kid, and I passed it down. Just follow in my footsteps, and you will not sink. Just follow me. If you, if you go off this trail, I'm going to have to pull you up out of the snow. Just follow my, my footprints. Just follow me. And we do this to our kids because we want them, one, we don't want to have to pull them out from the depths of like three feet under the snow. But two, we want them to be safe. We want them to know that if you just follow your daddy, you're going to be safe. I won't let anything happen to you. We do this not just in things like that, but anywhere you go. When my youngest used to have a fear of the dark, and he needed the nightlight, and he decided, I don't need the nightlight anymore, Daddy. But before he got there, I said, you know what? You don't have anything to be afraid of. You want to know why? Because your daddy lives in this house. Now, I don't know how I would respond if somebody came in. I'm pretty sure I would hurt them. But I want him to know that your daddy will do whatever he needs to do for you to be safe. Right? I will sacrifice myself for you to be safe. I want you to know this because I love you and I, I, you don't have anything to worry about. But I'm afraid of that dark closet. Don't worry. I'll take whatever's in this closet. I'll take it out for you. And then we always end it with, you know what else you have for you? God is watching over you. He will protect you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And he got to a point where he goes, Dad, I don't need that happen anymore. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve more years and you're out of here. <laughs> For our kids to be safe, to follow us the best we can, but we're fallible. Can you imagine now how much better that is with God in heaven, Jesus interceding for us, just saying, just follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on my promise. I won't let you down. I will protect you when it gets tough. I'm not going to say I'm not going to give you things that you can't handle, because there are many things in this life that we can't handle, but he won't give us anything that he can't handle with us. And some of you have been there. Some of you are going there now. But we can trust that God is faithful. He will protect us and guide us when we follow him and stay in his life and walk in his grace. We get to the destination he has planned for us, eternity with him in heaven. That is our promise. That is our gift. And that is our hope. And I hope that we can hold on to that promise and not be detoured uh, the other voices that come in our way. So what I want to offer us this morning is if you have maybe been falling to that trap that Satan has for you, you need prayer, I want to, I would love to pray with you. Um, our church would love to pray over you. It's not a judgment thing. You don't have to be afraid. It is great to have righteous people or those who know we're sinners and we, we need Jesus to pray over each other. That is a biblical truth. If there's power in that prayer. But there's also a gift that if you don't know who Jesus is and you want to know what it means to have your identity found in Christ, I want to sit with you. I want to, I want to discuss that a little bit further. And we have some warm water to put you in uh, if you want to make that commitment this morning. So I want to pray over us. And then if you have any needs, you're just going to come forward as we stand and sing the song after the prayer. Then, Father, Lord, you're an awesome God. We don't deserve you. Uh, we don't deserve the sacrifice of your son. We deserve to be on the cross. And you loved us anyways. I don't know how we can thank you any more than just trying our best to live a life that is worthy of that sacrifice, God. Not to pay it back, but just to live in your grace and just love you with how we live. And I pray that you give us the strength to endure this world, that you give us the ears to hear your voice alone and follow it, God. Help us in our, our daily walks that when we lose sight of you, that uh, we just ask for forgiveness and a new start in your mercy, God. That we live according to your grace and your love, and we can be a beacon of light to this community, to our families, to our coworkers, and whoever else we come across, God, that they may know that we are your disciples by the way we love them, and the way that we live our lives to follow you, God. We are so thankful for that. For those who are hurting, God, I pray that you give them comfort. For those who are struggling physically, God, I hope that they can see you through the pain and and that you give them wisdom and decisions that they need to make and comfort and healing. And God, for those who are questioning whether or not they need to, to follow you and, and commit themselves to baptism, God, I pray that they do not push that off, that they know the importance of what it means to be saved 
in your blood, in your broken body, God, and in an empty tomb, that we may have life eternal with you. And I pray that you put that off and make that commitment to me. Again, God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this family that loves you and wants to do our best to worship you the way we know. And I pray that you encourage us to get deeper in that knowledge of what it means to be your followers, God. We praise your son's name. Amen. 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 Amen.